Hello, Tech Pros, episode 191. I think that there's a little bit of a macho ethic of developers that, you know, these are feats of strength. You need to learn it the hard way, but really, if you look at it, it's not productive at all. We end up solving the problem. Welcome to the podcast where I chat with professionals who are getting the job done using technology seven days a week. Each week, we start with Motivation Monday. Tuesday is about productivity, Wednesday, leadership, Thursday, technology, Friday, people in communication, Saturday, entrepreneurship, and Sunday, being unplugged. All right, let's get started. Hello, Tech Pros. This is Chad Bostic, and I'm excited to introduce our featured guest today, Jim Cole. Happy Tuesday, Jim. Happy Tuesday to you, Chad. Are you prepared to be productive? Always looking out for that. Awesome. And doing it. Yes. Fantastic. Jim Cole has 33 years of experience delivering solutions across a wide range of industry domains, including banking, insurance, aircraft, point of sale, and CAD CAM. He's an avid promoter of technologies to help developers become better software engineers and collaborators. Recently, Jim transitioned into DevOps as a great way to help do this. So, Jim, I love this. Uh, I love the fact that you're moving into DevOps and 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 helping everybody kind of cross these these technology domains, right? Because, man, so many times in my past, in the in the history of 20 years of Chad working in software development, it has been very much like the dev people over here and the ops people over here, and never the the two shall meet. So, we need more people kind of crossing those boundaries. Yeah, absolutely, Chad. I think that uh, DevOps really gives a unique vantage point to work on problems at a different level. I'll have to say I typically stay closer to the dev side because really that's my heritage, but it does give a really unique place, uh, maybe outside the normal grind of every sprint, driving feature after feature to the conclusion. This gives us a chance to work on higher level features that really benefit everybody. Yeah, I, I, it's kind of like the unsung heroes of the team, right? So the people who are working on product features, that's awesome. You're getting out things that directly uh, help the customers, the, meaning the end users of the software that you're building. But the, the DevOps folks are really supporting the team who are trying to build all these things, right? It's, it's the plumbing and the glue and the servers and the infrastructure that helps run all of the amazing software that the rest of the team is working on. Yeah, I completely agree. And it almost seems like I would use the word as developer advocacy. And uh, but to me, those are really important because it, it seems that in sometimes in an agile world where you've got maybe a little bit less technical group kind of orchestrating things that sometimes the developer's perspective, maybe just there's certain things that just fall through the cracks. And and you're like, oh my goodness, things could be so much better with not too much effort here. So let's take the time to, to invest in that and make it better. And that's why I just love DevOps because now I've got that opportunity. And I've got a very supportive um, team and, and a wonderful manager who just is totally behind these adventures. So. Fantastic. Well, speaking of improving things, Jim, as you know, today is Productivity Tuesday on Hello Tech Pros, and we're all about improving our productivity, getting more done with less time, more done with less resources, being more efficient with everything, uh, working better as a team. And so I want to start this conversation with asking you a personal question of a time in your life, in your career, when you were completely unproductive, and then uh, maybe we'll turn it around throughout the story and figure out how you uh, turn that situation around and became more productive. Sure, absolutely. So let's dive right in. You know, I guess the the idea of non-productive is all about perception, right? Whether you're looking in or you're looking out from yourself, and you can certainly feel unproductive, and that's not a really good place to be. And I think back, this time that you're asking about for me was on a project that really inspired a whole bunch of things that we're going to be talking about today. And in that project, it was very new technology. A lot of it was homegrown. Uh, there were actually at the time two teams, and they were pretty small teams. And there's a lot of information that scuttled back and forth between these small teams. And we had a, we had a third team. And I remember 
getting in there and start working to get that application because I was brand new to that particular software project and really trying to get up to speed with what everybody was done. And I'd ask questions and I'd get all these different answers from people. Well, that might work and that might work. And my mind, I couldn't get anything to run. I mean, days and days and weeks of just Sometimes it worked, sometimes it wouldn't, and oh, we changed this, and this affects this, and a whole bunch of jargon that really didn't make any sense to me, or for that matter, some of the other people as well, and it just kept uh, kind of getting worse and worse, but I, I've always been that guy that wants to get in there and like really get it working as soon as I can, and then end up helping other people start to get their environments working as well. Mm-hmm. So with that in mind, certainly overcame it. It was a very, very frustrating time. I'm like, well, if this information is so important and we're going to be scaling our teams, which we did, we eventually got over a dozen teams. I think right now we're uh, we're higher. We've got a larger number than that. So this has grown very quickly. And I'm like, we've got to solve this problem. So that was a frustrating time for me. Many nights going home, like you want to bang your head against the wall. Like you get through it and once you do, that it does get better, but it helps when you can step outside a little bit and, and work to come back at it with, with some solutions. So anyways, that was the inspiration for what we're going to be talking about today. Gotcha. So you were in a situation where maybe one individual team kind of was being productive. They were getting their individual stuff done. But as you connected to disparate teams and put them together into like one Uber team, one bigger team, then there was a little bit of tension. There was a little bit of communication breakdown. And then as you add a third and a fourth, it sounds like it just kept getting worse and worse because of the, not necessarily the the technical issues between the teams, maybe, maybe not, but more than that, the communication, like how the teams were working together, how they were sharing information, how they were sharing their processes. Right, because, I mean, if you're on one of those original teams and you start seeing this arrival in waves of new people, you're like, um, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to take some time and allocate to help these people over something right now that is you know, evolving and changing and at times unstable and at other times stable. And uh, so it's sort of like trying to maybe describe to somebody a a work in progress piece of art that is not yet quite done. And sometimes it's hard to to articulate all the things when you yourself are really Mm -hmm. absorbing those changes because it's very dynamic. And I think our audience can certainly appreciate that they developers have been on projects that that really are in that sort of just out of the greenfield state. They're they're moving quickly and and then the management team decides, well, we're gonna throw a lot more resource at this and it's gonna ramp up <laughs> perfectly, right? right? So um that's that's the real challenge and we're all faced with that. Yeah, I think if uh, if there's still anybody left in the audience who who loves the old school waterfall methodology, I, I'm kind of laughing to myself about that because, you know, in in that mindset, it's like, well, if you have the perfect plan, then when you add more resources, you're just executing the plan, and so nothing is changing. You're just doing what's written down in my 1,000 page requirements document. But as as you know, Jim, things in the real world don't uh, don't lend themselves to unchange, right, or consistency. It lends themselves to constantly adapting, constantly changing the requirements, constantly adding new things, and that means that the individuals on the team are just trying to keep up with, like, hey, uh, what I was working on yesterday has now changed into something completely different today how am i going to do that and now you've got a a new team of 10 or 12 people coming on board trying to okay what's what's the requirements what should i be working on and you're like well that's a great question uh i'm uh let me let me see if i can figure that out right so we turn to our tried and true oh we planned an iterations where the sprints and look we were just perfect planners and it's all right here so you're going to go pick this up and your team is going to go pick this up but honestly, as human beings, I don't think we're, we're that omniscient. And I think we get into situations where you can't, you can't see that far ahead. And the reason you can't is because all the things change very quickly in a sprint as we learn. I mean, we're learning all along the way. And with those new learnings, clearly our future predictions are no longer valid or mm-hmm. less valid. How about that? 
So that's, okay, that's so, a challenge. Yeah, so what, what were you guys able to do or find like as the root cause to implement in this situation that started bringing uh, people together? Hmm. So that's, that's a great question. You know, I think some of it is really just get through it, right? <laughs> um, because when you're like in that moment, you have to just put your shoulders down, square your shoulders and, and get through it and be kind along the way and patient with all those people that are on the team that's been there for a while and work to get all that information out. So, you know, when I, I mean, my first attempt to do this was like, I watched all these people coming on and I, I created a, what I called the missing manual. I mean, there's a published name of books by that name. I don't know if that was my inspiration or not, but I created this missing manual and it actually was quite long, but it explained everything that you needed to know. And, and I share that and people were like, Oh, this is great. Thank you so much. But over time it became so unwieldy to maintain really did. I mean, people benefited from it. It made their life. They knew where to go and what to install and all that stuff. But, um, and then I realized there's all this other information I can't possibly capture in this, this one document. It's already for God's sakes, it's 60 pages long. I, I don't want to like write a thousand page doc. So, um, but anyway, that was a, a gap solution. But as we got through this, I realized that, you know, there had to be a better way for all of us to share information better. And certainly at an industry in the world, there's, there's plenty of, of, of vehicles to carry our information forward. I mean, there's wikis, and, you know, Lord knows there's Google to find answers to, but I realized very quickly that, you know, Google and um, Stack Overflow, which are really awesome, you can never find any of the things that we were experiencing on our teams. I mean, all the setup information, all this domain information, architecture information, because it's all homegrown. It couldn't possibly exist there. So what we did is we, you know, I took a good hard look at that, and I kind of bounced this idea around of, of, you know, could we have a repository that really wasn't like Jive? We have Jive. That is very much a very broad, almost uh, dumping ground for all sorts of things. I wanted something a lot more focused. So we were in the process of transitioning to GitHub. And for our, our audience out there, I'm sure many of you probably are using GitHub, and it is, it is a wonderful tool. And there's a learning curve and all that. We were getting ready to roll that out to the organization. So um, in the process of that, I thought, okay, as we roll this out, there's, there's some training, there's, there's how we want to use it, there's all of this that we wanted to get out to our rather large, growing organization of developers. So um, I thought, well, I need a platform. So it occurred to me, why not um, start, you know, get, get using GitHub, get some of the people using GitHub on our team, and we did and before we rolled it out. This is three or four months in advance. And we and I'm like, well, why don't we just use GitHub, possibly, to store all this information? Because I got to thinking, you know, there's a workflow that we use for software in GitHub, and it works quite well. It has a review cycle. It has a precision about it. And there's also this um, format called Markdown, which allows you to very nicely capture the kinds of things you want to put in a document. And there's an adaptation. GitHub has this thing called GitHub Pages. And we started to take a look at that. And what it'll do is it'll take all these markdown files and it'll convert them into you know, a really nice job converting these things over into HTML. And voila, now you've got a publishing system. So we, we took a whack at it and, and you know, did some really simple stuff. And then basically grew this into a hierarchy of content and all the kinds of things that is really that tribal knowledge, but now it's made concrete in a place. Everything that was in the missing manual converted that over into a series of chapters in Markdown, you know, from setups to the other information that we've been picking up along the way. So took that initial conversion and really started to heavily leverage GitHub pages. We rolled out our training on that platform to people. And, you know, everyone's like, well, why not use a wiki, blah, blah, blah. There's always more than one way to solve a problem, right? But I wanted, wanted to give this a shot as an experiment, and we did. And we're still doing it, and it's growing, and we've got 
the, you know, the success of anything like this really depends on everyone on the teams starting to not only consume the information, but to contribute and to contribute their hard-earned knowledge. And so we did. So out of that, um, we now have a system, and it is really, really awesome. And we're, we just continue to grow it, and we're adding things in. And, and out of that, uh, we, we've done some more things, and we've sort of taken the show on the road a bit. So I can talk about that in a little bit. But um, how about you? Do you have any questions about that? Yeah, so um, I, I love the idea of, hey, we're adopting a new platform. We're moving our our source code repo over to the GitHub uh, platform, right? And so what else can this tool do? Because I love uh, consolidating my tool set, me personally. I love to, okay, if we have, um, do we really need 100 micro tools or, or is there one tool that can take on multiple things? Not that there's one Uber tool that's going to rule the world and it's going to have everything in it, but what additional value can I get out of this tool that I'm investing in? So I love the fact that you went this direction and experimented. So when people started a- asking the question, though, okay, yeah, we can see that this can work, right? We can uh, We can learn... Uh, the markdown format, everybody can get used to that. That's no big deal. Okay, now we're creating pages in here in the GitHub pages and creating basically an, an online document like chapter by chapter in this new tool. But there are other tools available, right? As you said, there's wikis and, and there's there's other repositories, um, you know, Google Docs and all that kind of stuff. What really drove you guys to make the decision that we're going to stick with this solution as opposed to experimenting on some of the other platforms as well? Right. So, um, you know, we had had some time on Wing with Jive, which is a great platform. Its its real strong point is collaborating and kind of more in the moment chat. So a lot of this formation of this body of knowledge is, I'm going to say, once these they, these documents have to evolve, but once they're in, you know, they kind of, they, they have a constitution about them that really just want to make sure they're accurate and they're evolving over time. So in doing that, we want to make sure the content is accurate. So a lot of the system, like if you use Google Docs, like for example, my son uses that a lot with his papers. He's like, Dad, you take a look at this. I mean, we can both see our changes live, which is really cool, but there's no revision control around this. Right? There's no kind of like, oh, I saw that you changed this because I just I happened to notice that you made that change in that, that paragraph. But there's like there's really not a workflow that's formalized. So that's the the nature of some wikis, same way. I mean you can add content, you can you can add comments to them and so forth and wikis, but again, same kind of thing. And then like with you know, Jive, you there's kind of a workflow there and you can see, oh yeah, he changed it or she changed it on this date, and this is what's changed. But it's such a, it's, it's so massively big. What we wanted to do is scale it down at one place where all the content goes, make it easily searchable. And with GitHub, you can do that with Markdown and Jekyll, by the way, it's the, it's the static server that this is based on. These guys did a fantastic job building this, so I, I can't say enough about that. But anyway, there's a lot of things we started to find on that were available, plugins or otherwise, or code that we sort of adapted that we could do a really quick search. You, every every uh, markdown file you create, you can, you can tag it. And depending on how you tag it, it's going to be more valuable to people. And in a search, you can easily find it. And at the end of this podcast, I'll be happy to share um, some starter sites that people can go you know, play with. But the thing of the matter is, is the advantages were is having a workflow and a review process. So we've got some really smart people around here, and I want to make sure that the content that people that they're adding is accurate. So this idea of having a review board, um, this is evolving. Uh, we've, but we've got people that know their stuff, and they're making sure that what goes in is accurate and that it's not duplicate and that it is um, fully thought out, right? That's part of the problem. Because what happens, I, I forgot to mention one way we share information besides the cube-to-cube conversations. The other one is predominant, and it's email, right? So somebody's running into a problem, so they, they send to a distro, I'm having this problem, somebody else says, here's how you do it. And they put out, like, part of the information, not all the information. 
So to me, you know, as developers, we commerce in the how of things, you know, how things work. This is how it works. This is how it should be done. But the thing we leave out all the time, are like, well, what about context such as what and why, really important, who and when? These are other questions that really need to be answered. And, and we also work, um, we have a Mac and Windows environment. So typically, uh, like a Windows user might say, well, do this. But they don't give the rest for the Mac user. So there's already uh, an incomplete context, and it only helps some of the people. And then anyways, it's bouncing around in emails, and then it grows into this big chain, and before you know it, there's more than one uh, solution maybe put out there, and it's just like, well, email gets purged every 60 days anyway. So where did that go? So you can start to see that all these systems that we've kind of grown into in our careers really aren't serving us very well. And this seemed like a golden opportunity to at least experiment with it, and that's why we went this direction. And, it, and it's really it's really paying off. Yeah, man, I feel your pain on, on both of those instances. First of all, in email, I hate email, right? I hate it for in, in this area because when you're trying to solve problems, as a team and you're emailing out a, uh, a distribution list or you're just sending it to one person, right? I'm sending it to my buddy Jim and he goes, well, I kind of know X, Y, Z, but I'm going to CC Lawrence on that. Lawrence, what do you think? And then Lawrence is going to invite everybody from the DevOps team and then the DevOps team is going to reference somebody. And, the, and pretty soon you got everybody in the organization on this thread and half the people or 98% of the people don't need to be there. And then as a consumer of trying to boil down all the conversations and all the threads that are happening into, okay, yeah, but like, what do I actually need to do? How much of this can I ignore? And how much could I, could I boil it down to the, the, the solve, right? The solve my problem and implement it to get it done. And then second of all, the point about the wikis, you know what? I haven't, I haven't thought about this issue in many, many years, but I have absolutely run into that problem many times, whether it's it's Google Docs or whether it's Wikis or whether it's SharePoint or whatever the tool is, when you don't have a review board or a revision board or someone in place to kind of watch the changes, right? So many times the, the requirements document or the setup document, the infrastructure documents, the whatever it is, all that documents, all that documentation in your project, that stuff is fluid and is dynamic. And you can miss things. And I have missed things so many times because nobody told me, hey, did you check, you know, paragraph three on page 48 on, you know, document that says set up your new PC, right? That is applicable also to like maintaining your current PC. So we need to all go back and make sure that we do that. And uh, it's just like, well, I updated the doc, right? The doc is updated. That was that was the step I was required to do. But that doesn't mean that everybody's going to be aware of the important changes versus just the, okay, well, as new people roll on to the team, they've now got it. And so I love the idea of having this revision board. It's, it's you know, it's just like doing a, a pull request for your code, right? You're saying, hey, somebody check my code. I'm, I think it's good. Somebody do quality control on it. Uh, somebody take a look at it and then approve whether or not it goes into like the main branch, the master branch. And then, and then it's up to that person, you know, person or persons to decide how to disseminate that information back to the team. Hey, FYI, Jim made this change and uh, it's a really, really big deal and everybody needs to be aware of this. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, we live in a world of diluted attention, diluted attention, and we, we experience this every day, right? I mean, we're getting bombarded with so much. And then we, you know, we're working away on our code, and all of a sudden an email pops out. Oh, now I'm distracted. Now I go over there. Oh, okay, there's a problem, and there's a solution, and you're watching the bouncing ball, but now my attention is disrupted. And um, maybe I need to do something about this. Maybe not. I'll look. But when I really need to do something about that, I really want to know that, right? And I want a very concise and clear way to handle it. So um, I think a lot of times people just don't take the time when they're packaging up like, like something that is impacting the rest of the teams to really roll it out as sort of a campaign. So with a tool like this, you can do that, right? You can package it up. You can make sure you cover all your bases. 
and you've got other people that have had input, and GitHub is such a nice collaborative tool that everybody can really say, well, what did you think about this? You forgot that. What did you think about this? And so by doing that, we've already like helped solve the diluted attention problem to an extent, right? So that's, that's probably, to me, the workflow issue was the, one of the more important aspects of, of going to this, right? Because we're, we're already using pull requests. And the nice thing about this is that, you know, you as a user, Jed, you can, you can basically fork off your own copy and then you can make a clone. And what we've got set up is, you know, our desktop tools. We, we actually use IntelliJ. A few people use Atom. But we've got it set up so that you can literally go in there, make all your changes, run them on a local server, a local Jekyll server, and it's really quite easy to do. And you can render and see all your changes right there. And then when you're ready, you push them up to your fork. And then I, as a reviewer, can come in and I can look at your fork. I can see everything rendered there, see how it looks, see if there are any just like, you know, kind of errors and how you did the markdown and or maybe there's some better ways to frame up the information. And we can have a dialogue on that and get to that, to that point where that pull request is still open and finally get to closure and it's out there for the world to see. And then there's ways that you, know, you can disseminate that change with you know, sort of like a campaign board or like a in the news kind of thing. Uh, you know, we've been growing with that and experimenting with that as well. But, but right there, now you've got the information like an order of magnitude and a better shape, right? Because it's a full context for people, and you've given it to them at the right time. Um, and it's, it's not like in the process of being baked. It is baked. It's complete as much as it can be. We know change occurs. It will happen to the days we die and beyond. It's just the way it is. We live in a changing world, but this at least helps to some degree. So, Jim, I want to ask you about how we can get started in this area, how we can set up our own a tool set on this stack. But first, let's take a quick break and thank our sponsors. This episode of Hello Tech Pros is sponsored by Minio Cloud Storage. Minio is a cloud object storage server for developers and DevOps written in Go. The Go programming language is the emerging language of choice for modern cloud infrastructure projects, and it allows Minio to be highly concurrent and lightweight. Minio is Amazon S3 compatible, built with microstorage architecture in mind, but at its heart, Minio is simple, scalable, and supported by a passionate developer and user community. In episode 89 of Hello Tech Pros, I talked with A.B. Periasami, one of the founders of Minio, about the importance of community support and recruiting software developers who are as passionate about their product's code as artists are of their art. Check out that episode at hellotechpros.com slash 89 and check out Minio Cloud Storage at Minio.io. That's M-I-N-I-O dot I-O. Are you new to podcasting? Are you looking for a fast, high-quality, yet budget-friendly podcast production team? Let Transource Media take care of you. With a team of professional audio and video editors, writers, and graphic artists, they can help you build your podcast from planning, post-production, and platform submission. Using only cutting-edge software and studio equipment, they're here to make each and every show sound at its best. To get a free quote, please visit www.transourcemedia.com or send them an email at marketing at transourcemedia.com or call them at 209 209- 505-5693. Transource Media, transforming businesses through the power of multimedia. Okay, we're back with Jim Cole. Jim has 33 years of experience delivering solutions across a wide range of industry domains. He's recently transitioned into DevOps, and we've been talking to Jim about the productivity losses in a team when the team can't keep track of all the different changes that are going on at the informational level, right? Not at the software level, but at the, hey, what are the requirements? What are the setups? What are the the infrastructure settings that I need to apply? Um, where's this server? What's that server? You know, all the things about how, how the team should run and why they should run and who is all connected to what, right? All the who's and what's and why's and where's to the project. All of those things can be very, very difficult to track. And if you're using just email to track that, if you're using... Uh, a wiki or or document library to track that stuff, there's probably some problems in your workflow. And you may have experienced the problem that there's no review board there to to really check the the 
the changes and to make sure that, first of all, the, this is appropriate and that it fully encompasses like both sets of users, both your Windows users and your Mac users. Um, but also that if it's a big change that everybody needs to know about, that we need to roll out that change like as a campaign and make people aware of it. So, Jim, I love this idea of solving this problem using GitHub pages and uh, some of the tools that you've been talking about. So if, if there's uh, listeners out there who are trying to get started and like, yeah, I want to give it a shot. I want to implement it on my team. Uh, do you have any quick steps to, to get them hooked up? Yes, I do. So, you know, first of all, sometimes it's hard for us to... <laughs> You know, look at our organization. We have an idea, you know, we, there's a nagging sense of like maybe things just aren't quite right. And that's okay. I mean, this is natural to get into the state. So we realize that maybe there might be a better way to solve some of these problems. And there's many ways to solve problems. So, you know, by all means, this isn't the only way. This is just an experiment that served us pretty well. But anyways, having a, sometimes a a model or a story to look at might help. So I'm going to kind of introduce to you really quickly um, a site and an experience that that we've grown out of our travels, if you will. And that is uh, this this whole idea of a metaphor of squirrels. We're 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 kind of like squirrels with you know being developers. We we really want to share our information with each other, but sometimes like squirrels, we we either don't know how, or we're not good sharers, or maybe we're a little protective. I mean, we're, we're human and squirrel-like at the same time. And so we kind of evolved this idea that information being acorns, we can eat those acorns really quickly and just get fat on that information ourselves. Or we can plant them in the ground and they can grow into trees, which produce more abundant uh, set of acorns that other people benefit from. So this whole metaphor grew into a, a whole story and there's a character named Zippy, and there's a site which Chad will be happy to provide at the end of the, the podcast, or at least on a site. And in that story, I'd encourage you to, to go look at it, and there's a video, too, you can see from GitHub. But at the end of the story, there is a repo which, has, uh, which actually has the site running. It's run by squirrels, so you know, temper your expectations, <laughs> but it's, it's kind of fun. And there's also the, the GitHub repo that you can download and start playing with. Start it and fork and copy for yourself and start playing with it. And if you really like it, we'd love to have contributors and we would like to hear how you're doing with it. So that, that's probably the easiest way to get started, at least experimenting with this class of, of sites called a uh, static, statically generated site. And again, there's more than one way than using just GitHub pages but we have found it to be a, a nice way to get started. Awesome, yeah, and we'll link that up. The, uh, the URL here is a, is a big long one. It's, it's too unwieldy to read off on the mic. So tell you what, we will link it up in the show notes page. Uh, Tech Pros, if you want to go to hellotechpros.com slash 191, this is episode 191. So go to hellotechpros.com slash 191, and we'll have all the resources and links uh, that Jim's talking about here. Jim, before we go, do you have any parting words of wisdom for our audience? And then share the best way that we can connect with you, and then we'll say goodbye. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, um, first of all, some thanks, because without this team, this great team, and my, my wonderful manager, we wouldn't be uh, talking here today about this and, and the organization that's been receptive to what we're doing. So I definitely wanted to say that and all their names and all that that's out in the presentation. So um, as far as words of wisdom goes, here's the thing. There's information you cannot find out there with all the tools we're used to using because it lives locally. And what it leads us to is trying to solve problems that have already been solved. And I think that there's a little bit of a macho ethic of developers that, you know, these are feats of strength. You need to learn it the hard way. But really, if you look at it, it's not productive at all. We end up solving the problem over and over, developer by new developer. So there's a better way. And what we really want to do is we want to change the focus from solving problems that have already been solved to solving problems that are more important, that are higher order problems that the organization and the owners of the company really think are more important. So by doing some of these things, we're shifting the focus to solving new problems that are more important. So um, that really, that's the payoff. 
And the presentation you're going to look at is called Transforming Tribal Information into Learning Trees. And really, I do think by, by doing these things that we have succeeded in doing so. And I would encourage our listeners to do the same. And as far as keeping in touch, I uh, would encourage you to go out and look at the site. And also, my Twitter handle is at Jim D. Cole, J-I-M-D-K-O-H-L. And we'd love to hear from you. And there you go. Jim, thank you so much for joining me on Hello Tech Pros. I really value this story about, you know, what we need to not work on the same problems over and over and over because I feel that so many times in the technical spaces, whether it be software development or DevOps or the infrastructure side, the operations side, um, we love solving difficult problems. And sometimes the most difficult problems are the ones that we've solved over and over and over. Like three other people, three other generations of workers behind us have already solved these problems. What we really need to solve, as you very awesomely said, are the big business problems that uh, the, the business leaders want to have solved, and they don't want to hear problems about, you know, some of the some of the plumbing and some of the network and some of the setup and all that kind of stuff. Just like, hey, fix all that stuff and get to the big problem, which is the new the new app, the new tool, the new business capabilities that we're trying to put together. And so I love this idea of, of, of making it all smoother for the development team so you can stop having those arguments and uh, start solving the real business problem. So thanks for sharing that with us today. Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm very grateful. Thanks, Chad. You bet. Tech pros, if you are in a situation where it makes sense to you, but it doesn't make sense to other people, um, you, you need to be spending more time on the communication and information side. So when I was growing up as a developer, I felt that it, well, first of all, I felt like an imposter a lot of times because like, I don't know what's going on here. I'm just trying to keep track of my little thing. So that's good to keep track of your thing, but you also need to be aware of the bigger picture. What's going on around you in the cubes next to you and the teams down the hall in the other departments in the, uh, in the, in the remote offices. So it's not just about getting your work done and understanding how your stuff works, right? It's also being aware of everyone else's, you know, not to the mundane details, but just the overall picture of what are people working on and how does it work? Because there's probably things that you can learn from them that you can implement into your own processes, into your own work streams. And there's also stuff, you know, problems that you solve or problems that you see other people solve that somebody else is struggling with. So it is in our best interest to improve, improve, improve our communication process whenever we get the opportunity. And so I invite you, I challenge you next week to really take a look at um, those issues in your area and see what you can improve. You've been listening to Jim Cole, and I'm Chad Bostic. And until next time, take care. The show notes page for this episode can be found at hellotechpros.com slash 191. Do you use Slack for team communication? Join the Hello Tech Pros Slack channel at hellotechpros.com slash slack. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review, subscribe to this channel, and check back tomorrow. This has been Productivity Tuesday, but tomorrow my featured guest and I are talking about leadership. Thursday, technology. Friday, people in communication. Saturday, entrepreneurship. Sunday, being unplugged. Monday, motivation. And then we do it all over again next Tuesday for productivity. And I'll talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow.